play the prevailing winds on cannabis finance. Nine days after an election where cannabis was on the ballot in several states, and at the end of, the, of a year that saw significant congressional action on cannabis finance, seems an opportune time to talk about it. As a refresher for the audience, why is cannabis finance an issue? Well, cannabis remains illegal under federal law. More and more states are legalizing cannabis in some fashion, as we'll hear shortly, and it has been fully legalized in Canada. There is increasing activity surrounding the cannabis business, including M&A deals, IPOs, ETFs, um, uh, mutual fund solicitations, even as recently as this morning, um, and uh, with banks, investment advisors, investors, all are concerned at some level with becoming ensnared in, in a violation of federal law, in most cases money laundering, despite all of this economic activity. And although FinCEN and other regulators have developed a rubric for handling cannabis related proceeds, there's still a lot of uncertainty and all manner of risk appetite around the industry. So we will talk about that today with my panel of experts who all confront these issues nearly daily in their specific roles. I'll just quickly introduce them to you. I hope that you'll go to our website and review their full bios. Uh, in, by no means am I uh, minimizing their accomplishments by just briefly touching on their background. Uh, my first panelist is Andrew Klein. He is the National Cannabis Industry Association's Director of Public Policy. Um, this role was established at the end CIA in 2019, and Andrew leads that entity's substantive public policy efforts, striving to prepare and protect the state legal cannabis industry. He also leads NCIA's Policy Camp Council, a group of its members focused on influencing state and federal public policy. Um, Andrew was also the head of the National Association, the president of the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, which was the first self-regulatory organization for the high growth cannabis industry. And prior to that, um, uh, Andrew had many jobs in the federal government, including as a federal prosecutor, as a senior policy advisor in the executive office of the president under President Obama and with the Federal Communications Commission. Katrina Carroll is the Executive Vice President and Chief Anti-Money Laundering Officer for LPL Financial and its affiliate, the Private Trust Company. Uh, and she is a return guest to the cannabis, to the Cadwallader Finance Forum and our cannabis panel. She is responsible for all aspects of the institution's anti-money laundering um, and OFAC programs. Prior to that uh, role, Katrina was in private practice at a very fine firm in Washington, DC where she counseled clients on all sorts of anti-money anti laundering and regulatory matters and sanctions matters. And she also served as outside counsel to SIFMA's Anti-Money Laundering and Financial Crimes Committee. She too had a long career in the federal government um, and uh, uh, including terms at the Securities and Exchange Commission and at the Treasury Department. Uh, and finally, last but not least, Doug Fisher is the general counsel of Greenlane, uh, a public company listed on NASDAQ, GNLN, uh, for those who are interested. Um, it is the leading global platform for the development and distribution of premium cannabis accessories and lifestyle products. So he will have a lot to say about how it feels on the ground to be uh, a victim, if you will, of cannabis finance uh, uh, conservatism. Doug was previously at Cadwallader Wickersham and Taft, uh, which you all know, uh, since you're here at our finance forum. Uh, he was uh, an associate in my group um, and he represented corporations and individuals in an array of settings uh, across the white collar and regulatory space. Um, he worked with Andrew at the National Association of Cannabis Businesses. He was the chief legal officer there. And he has deep experience in the Anti-Money Laundering Laws and Controlled Substances Act. Um, I'm going to get to my questions uh, right now. So Andrew first, can you tell us what's the state of play uh, all, for all post-election in each of the states that had a cannabis initiative on the ballot? Are we gonna be fully legal in the United States? 
<laughs> That's a loaded question. Thanks, Jody. You know, look, we're seeing lots of momentum at the state level, but uh, still very little progress at the federal level so far, with few exceptions where Democrats have led. Uh, but let's just start with the polling, which is just off the hook. You know, there was a Gallup poll about a year ago showing that 90% of Americans supported legalizing medicinal cannabis. And last week, um, uh, Gallup had another poll which showed 68% of Americans favoring uh, legalizing um, recreational. Um, and progress at the state level on November 3rd was 100% passage rate. So for you, political jumpity, junkies, the cannabis industry received 538 electoral votes on November 3rd, and nobody asked for a recount. There were no lawsuits. Mike Pompeo has not challenged our historic wins, and we didn't need to hold a press conference at the Four Seasons. Uh, everyone <laughs> accepted our victories. So um, all five states um, that had uh, ballot initiatives uh, passed. We now have 36 states that have medicinal cannabis programs. Uh, 15 states now allow recreational sales. So let's look um, at rec, uh, New Jersey, South Dakota, and Arizona legalized uh, recreational marijuana. Uh, Montana, South Dakota, and Mississippi legalized medicinal marijuana. Um, in New Jersey, uh, the vote was 66%, uh, um, which, is, which is a good high mark. And, and legalization in, in New Jersey put some pressure on New York now and Connecticut. As a matter of fact, the uh, Speaker of the House designee in Connecticut recently said that he thought that legalization in Connecticut was inevitable now because of New Jersey. Um, in Arizona, the, the vote was 66%. Um, and we already saw Maricopa County starting to dismiss pending marijuana charges, which is a pretty big deal in Maricopa County uh, until this election was a pretty conservative county. Um, South Dakota uh, legalized both medical and uh, recreational in one fell swoop, which was pretty uh, amazing, with 66 in support of medical. Um, that's about um, the same as, as national polling on, on recreational in a very conservative state. Um, in that state, uh, they, they spent $1.7 million dollars um, for legalization as opposed to $200,000 on the campaign against legalization. Um, and I forgot to mention in New Jersey, uh, those numbers were 573,000 uh, for legalization and $8,875 8, $8, were spent in opposition. Um, in Montana, 56% uh, voted in favor. That's the same percentage of votes um, in California four years ago, in California. Uh, Montana has been consistently a pretty red state, so that's pretty in, in, impressive. Um, in Montana, they spent uh, 7.2 million as opposed to 307 million, um, excuse me, 307,000 in opposition. And in Mississippi, Mississippi uh, has legalized medical marijuana $4.7 million was spent um, on that campaign as opposed to 312,000 in opposition. So lots of great progress at the state level. So, um, you know, those, those numbers are, are really um, uh, fascinating. And, and it seems like, you know, there's either, either the, the anti-legalizers are very poor or there's just not a lot of um, momentum behind them anymore. Do you think that the results of these elections, the fact that maybe legalizing or liberalizing were not hard fought, that um, you know, we will see some changes at the federal level? Um, and, and I guess I would also ask you to comment on, on whether the presidential and US Senate electoral results um, factor into these very overwhelming state successes. Absolutely. Look, I mean, I think there's no putting the genie back in the bottle at this point, right? Um, you know, we, we are seeing so much momentum at the state level uh, that it's just really hard to ignore. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing some movement um, in Congress soon, um, uh, you know, on the MORE Act and, and potentially on safe banking. Okay, well, let's let's talk about um, both of those, and then just for the audience who might not be um, uh, fully 
fully informed safe banking act was the was the anti money laundering statute mm -hmm. that essentially gave safe harbor to banks that um, banked banks and financial institutions that banked state legal cannabis businesses. The Moore Act was actually a, a, a more expansive, um, uh, not decriminalization, but, but rescheduling statute with a lot of social justice and expungement um, pieces in it. Um, both were on the floor of, of Congress this year. And, and at the end of the day, neither passed. Andrew, um, NCI, A's view on, on, on what the problems were, why those didn't ultimately get to votes in the Senate, um, why Moore didn't even get the hearing in the House that it was supposed to have, um, and why do you think that's going to change in the coming year? Yeah, I mean, look, on, on safe banking, um, the bill passed by a vote of 321 to 103 in September of 2019. Um, and still hasn't uh, even seen a hearing in the Senate. Um, you know, Mike Crapo and Mitch McConnell have been pretty pretty hostile to cannabis, have basically done less than zero uh, to support safe banking or anything else. But there have been some, uh, some positive indications in, in recent days. Um, Pat Toomey, who is likely going to be taking over the banking committee, has indicated um, a willingness to consider holding a hearing on safe banking. And he's retiring in two years. He, he's not facing re-election. So this could be a real opportunity for, uh, for the industry. Um, and I think, you know, we really need, as the industry, we need to make the economic case uh, to him. Um, uh, there's, you know, a medical market in Pennsylvania um, likely over a $3 billion market in Pennsylvania if they were to open it up to rec. Um, and, and Pennsylvania is going to be losing, um, you know, tax revenue to neighboring states um, if they don't take some action. So, so on, on SAFE, I actually think, um, you know, we could potentially see some movement in the Senate. Um, on the MORE Act, we didn't, we didn't have the votes in October and I'm assuming that there was a whip count recently because, uh, you know, and, and, and a whip count showing that, that more will pass because they have scheduled a floor vote in December. Um, there's been, you know, no action in the Senate and make no mistake, there, there, there won't be any action in the Senate on this bill, um, even, even when the House passes it. But it'll set the stage for 2021 and the 117th Congress. Um, the MORE Act doesn't have a regulatory plan, um, and, and it needs one. And the industry really needs to get behind a regulatory plan that they want. Um, we actually published a, a white paper back in October of 2019, which you can find on our website, um, that kind of lays out what we think that regulatory plan should look like. Uh, we broke it down into four lanes. So our recommendation is that the FDA retain jurisdiction over pharmaceuticals, so still do clinical trials. And if you wanna make health claims, that's the lane for you. Um, THC products above 3% would be regulated by the states, uh, the Department of Treasury and the FDA. And then ingestibles and topicals that fall below 0.3 would be regulated by the FDA. Um, and we think that uh, cannabis should be regulated like alcohol. Uh, that there should be a role for FDA and TTB and state regulators, but a limited role for, for DEA. Um, of course, the first step, you know, is accomplished in the MORE Act, and that's removing cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. But, um, you know, we need to do some other things uh, in that, in that uh, regulatory plan. So um, you may have seen, Jody, today, the state regulators um, announced today that they um, formed an association. And I think it's important for the federal government to step up and fund that association and really um, uh, coordinate with those, those state regulators. Um, and then okay. at its most basic, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. Yeah, just at its most basic level, the, the federal government's responsibility should be to register and tax uh, the state legal entities to regulate uh, interstate commerce and to set minimum standards on labeling and packaging and testing. But at the end of the day, we need to respect state sovereignty and let those state regulators do their job. 
Okay. Um, so that was a lot. I probably have 10 million questions. There are 170 people out there um, watching and we encourage you to um, please submit questions. Uh, we will try and get to some at the end, which is why I'm going to move away from all my uh, many follow-up questions for Andrew and move on to Katrina Carroll. So if you haven't um, noticed what I have, what we have is, is the real sort of political lobbying arm the banking, maybe where all of you are now, and then the business person that's in the mix of this responding to everything. So I think an interesting um, point of view from all the panelists. So let's, let's move to um, Katrina, who, who works at a regulated financial institution entity um, and, and is a, a compliance expert on AML. Um, Katrina, there's been, since you last spoke at our finance forum, which was about three years ago, certainly there's been a lot of movement in the cannabis space and Andrew just brought us um, up to date with a lot of great detail. Um, what has changed from a compliance standpoint, either speak generally about the industry or about LPL in particular, um, about dealing with um, cannabis related customers, meaning customers that have revenue, not from direct plant touching activities, but um, who might be adjacent to the cannabis business. Um, has anything changed for them in terms of um, being able to deal in a more open way with um, banks and other financial institutions, broker dealers, investment advisors? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, if I could just set the stage a little bit. So LPL Financial is a very large, ubiquitous, domestic uh, wealth management firm. But you can think of us as a string of small businesses. So our advisors operate all over the country in communities where there are marijuana-related, either direct or adjacent, thriving. And if I could just put my publicly public policy or treasury hat back on for a second and add a little fuel to Andrew, Andrew's fire, there's a real public safety issue in this conflict. And by that, I mean that local businesses are sitting on pallets of cash. I spent like a decade in the federal government trying to get people out of cash and into the formal financial sector. So this is a very perverse outcome of this, this conflict. Um, that's my soapbox <laughs> description. Um, but when you're at a wealth management firm like I, like I am, it's, it's different uh, than banks. Um, we have to look at at least three levels here. One is, like you said, marijuana related um, customers. Um, get back to that in a second. Marijuana related proceeds incoming and marijuana related investments. So it's a trifecta of issues for a firm like mine. And on the marijuana related customers, um, there's a spectrum, right? So the direct, sort of the direct hit haha, uh -huh, if you will, is the, mm -hmm. the growers and the, sorry, I can't, I can't leave a <laughs> panel hard, without it. It's hard not to do it. It's, <laughs> yeah, I can't leave a panel without it. Um, yeah. You know, there's the, there's a the very direct obvious, right? The growers and the dispensaries. But from then it becomes very, 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 very gray. And so um, there and different firms take different approaches. By and large, everyone is still prohibiting the obvious, um, um, full, you know, full marijuana businesses. That's all they do. Um, other considerations, so once you get beyond that to the gray area, considerations include, well, is this a business that exclusively targets itself to the cannabis industry, or is it just a small part of what they do? You can almost think of it for the, for the law school grads out there as like a substantial revenue test. But this is not written down anywhere. This is just sort of this equilibrium that the industry has kind of arrived at, or at least some firms have. Um, if you took it to its most absurd conclusion and you applied it, you applied that, that, um, con that conservative approach, you wouldn't be providing financial services to Lowe's or Home Depot because they offer grow lights and soil that could be used by a cannabis related entity. So obviously that's the other end of the spectrum and we're certainly not there. Um, the biggest question, so to answer your question about what has changed recently, the biggest question I keep getting is, okay, we have a marijuana related or cannabis related client. Can we ring fence the, the funds that we accept and the business that we do with them to exclude those cannabis related proceeds? 
And to your point, these issues come up almost every day. Pre-COVID, I was spending probably 30% of my time on this and some of my peers sp spend more. Um, and that requires a very bespoke solution. And it requires a lot of different players at the table. It's not just me. It requires your supervisors. It requires your surveillance. And you have to really ask yourself, you know, is this, what is our risk appetite for this? And what are we willing to spend to achieve that very bespoke supervision and compliance uh, arrangement? Okay, so there's, it sounds like there's some consideration and discussion, but not open arm hugs yet. No warm hugs. Um, I do. I do think okay. that. Um, I do think that it will get a little cozier um, in a Biden Harris administration. Uh, I think that with the with the topsy turvy statements from the um, Trump administration as to DOJ's approach here, we we were all just sort of paralyzed, right? I think. I mean, obviously, Vice President Elect Harris has made her her vision clear and I, I think there's a lot that that the administration can do without congressional action namely um, prosecutorial priorities sort of reversion back to what we saw in the Obama administration so I do predict some warming up so so on that uh, prosecutorial um, question so um, just to remind everybody in the audience for for quite a long time um, there, there was in the Justice Department what was known as the Cole Memo, uh, which basically told federal prosecutors to um, prioritize marijuana cases only if they uh, involved uh, the types of activities that you would see in normal criminal drug trafficking organizations and otherwise not to spend precious federal resources on prosecuting cannabis cases, even though it remained illegal. Sessions came in and famously undid uh, the coal memo, but there still has not been a huge um, increase even in the Trump administration of uh, cannabis related prosecutions. Question for you, Katrina, and then Doug, I'll ask you the same thing. Is, is the risk of prosecution as low as it is something that gives comfort to financial institutions wealth management companies, comp, you know, corporations, operational corporations in the business. Does the fact that, you know, when I tell my clients, look, uh, you know, there is a risk that you are violating the Controlled Substances Act and that you are uh, violating the anti-money laundering laws, but you will not get prosecuted for it. So go forth um, and profit. Is, is that a comfort to folks like you, Katrina? It is some comfort. Um, I think that the problem, of course, is how am I as an AML officer, how is my supervisory team supposed to know whether the business is or is not violating those priorities set forth in the coal memo? And so it could appear to be a clean business that doesn't market to children or deal with organized crime or all of that. But unless you're out there monitoring them, how are you going to know? So it, it's, a, it's getting us some comfort, but there's still an awful lot of ambiguity. So my thought is that the um, president-elect and vice president-elect, if they want to use their executive branch tools, they should go further um, and try to figure out a way to use whatever they can absent um, Senate action. Okay. Um, and I, I suppose that, um you know, compliance and the cost of compliance are, are a big question. Obviously some entities pass those costs down to customers, um, but uh, the bottom line for everybody is, is that you don't get the benefit of the protection of um, deprioritized cannabis prosecution unless you are really only complying with the state laws, which as Andrew pointed out and Katrina, as you point out, are, are quite varied and we'll hear how Doug manages it. And I mentioned at the top, um, just coincidentally, uh, I didn't cause this to happen. I got a solicitation today in my inbox to uh, invest in a cannabis growth fund, mutual fund vehicle. Um, and uh, they focus industry sector cannabis um, manufacturing and dispensaries. 
Now, how can that fund bank its assets? And, and how do you think that um, the bank that banked it and also the fund itself got comfortable with the risk that they are potentially violating either the Controlled Substances Act or the anti-money laundering laws? And, and um, what would you do if your client came in and said, uh, please put my money in uh, uh, Canex, which is the name of the mutual fund? Um, my immediate thought is Canada and Canadian banks. Um, as you know, it's fully legal up there. Um, yeah. And just as an aside, a compliance point yeah. for our, our uh, physical presence by the northern border, uh, you might want to think about whether any of your, uh, and, you know, any of your customers are um, engaging in stuff in Canada or perhaps at risk cross-border problems there. Um, no, it's a great question. I had the same question about investment bankers that got comfortable. So maybe I'll uh, talk to Doug offline about that. Um, but <laughs> obviously, someone is banking them. Um, and so it's possible that they have complex legal arguments that, you know, some of the, the great Wall Street firms are pairing up with their with their, um, their criminal uh, colleagues. Um, I think, you know, if, if I got the question, my firm has a pretty robust product, new product review process, um, and the expectation of regulators is that the, the AML team have a, a lens into that. And we're, we're quite conservative and very vanilla when it comes to that at my firm. So I doubt that it would come on board until these complexities are resolved. If you're talking about direct held positions at a fund company where our end client has a direct relationship with that fund company and we're the broker dealer of record, then it becomes more murky. There's a better argument that it's attenuated from us, mm -hmm. but it, it, there would be a lot of kind of mental gymnastics going on trying to look at that. Okay, fair enough. All right, Doug, let me turn to you. Um, is anybody having trouble hearing me, by the way? I'm getting a note that my audio is troublesome. You guys good though? Yes. It okay. fades in and out Doug, a little bit, but um, you're, you're okay. First, okay, thank you. Um, Doug, can you tell us a little bit about um, Green Lane and how it touches um, cannabis and the CBD space? Sure, and, and maybe I should say it doesn't, doesn't touch cannabis, uh, directly at least. <laughs> um, so thank you. Yeah, so uh, as you said at the top, we're a global platform for distribution of, of cannabis accessories and lifestyle product, which is sort of corporate speak for we sell anything that you would use to sell, store, process, or consume the plant. Uh, so anything from functional glass, rolling papers, vaporizer hardware, pre-rolled cones and uh, child resistant packaging is a big line for us. And so our customers range uh, a significant, uh, but certainly not even close to the majority of our customers are licensed cannabis businesses in states where cannabis is legal. And then for other products we sell to, to smoke shops, gift shops, uh, you know, sometimes called head shops. Uh, and then we have a substantial direct to consumer arm. So, you know, we don't touch the plant other than we do sell some hemp derived CBD products. And we've got a whole set of compliance procedures and rules around which products we carry and, and the documentation around those. But our, our connection is, is as an ancillary business. So, you know, the issues I think get really tricky for someone in Katrina's position when, when dealing with us, because undoubtedly there's cannabis money flowing through our business. Um, but our business is unambiguous, uh, or at least from my perspective, unambiguously compliant with federal law. Okay, um, so Greenlane, as I mentioned, is a public company listed on the NASDAQ. Um, you became, you went public in 2019. Um, tell us what, uh, tell us a little bit about the cannabis related and, and uh, disclosure discussions that came up with getting listed, if you will. Sure, yeah, and, and so I guess maybe first point I'd make on that, just, just because it might be of interest to this audience is, you know, we didn't really have those discussions with the SEC. I think from their perspective, they're concerned with uh, with proper disclosure under the law, and they're not here to judge uh, the business so much as to whether your disclosures are are accurate. Uh, so where the discussions come up with are are the banks, as Katrina alluded to, uh, and the uh, and the exchange as well. And so for us, the big question was, okay, given the products you carry. What about the Controlled Substances uh, Act prohibition on paraphernalia? 
And, and where we came out is, is, and there's a risk factor that anyone can look up and read, uh, is an explanation of why we're in compliance with the law, which essentially uh, comes down to uh, the categorization of the types of products we sell. And then for products that do fall into, you know, the statutory definition of paraphernalia, uh, a system of restrictions. So those are only sold in states where it's legal and therefore subject to the state exemption in that same statute. Um, do you continue, even with the loosening that Andrew has talked about and that Katrina talked about, do you continue to get questions from bankers or other vendors to you about your business and what are their concerns and how do you overcome them? How does a business in this business, a cannabis adjacent business, as you call it, um, get financing, get customers who are going to be accepting what you acknowledge is some funds from cannabis that are flowing through? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I think, you know, I would break the questions we get and the issues we get into sort of two categories. One is the, the legal compliance or strict legal compliance. And the other is, is more of the reputational type questions. I think there's absolutely a concern amongst some service providers. Uh, and so, you know, the first question we get is the same one we got from the exchange, which is okay, demonstrate to me that you are compliance with, fe compliant with federal law. And so whether that's a bank or a or someone who provides a major system for us or an insurance company will have these discussions, um, you know, and we'll, we'll share all our policies and procedures, what products are sold where, when it comes to CBD, here's the licenses for our vendors, here's the certificates of analysis for every product, here's the matrix of, uh, you know, here's the states and counties in which we don't sell products X, Y, and Z. Um, and then there's sort of a, a larger issue for some of them, which, it, you know, and and for some people, I should say that that conversation will get them comfortable, right? If if they're going to uh, be willing to have some exposure to the space, and and I would argue they should, given the opportunity here, uh, they'll get comfortable once they understand our compliance. There there is another set of of folks who probably just won't get comfortable, and it's it's understandable, although although regrettable. <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's an education process, I think, that, that has to go on as well about what the industry is and what the industry isn't. For people who aren't in the space, uh, there might be a lot of misconceptions, uh, you know, if their experience was, uh, you know, from their college days, let's, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the industry's grown up a lot. I mean, you can, you can see what these companies are reporting in their earnings, the type of management, the type of leadership. Um, and, and I think people, uh, investors should, should draw some comfort from that. Um, certainly for us, you know, having a NASDAQ listing is helpful in that, in that conversation. It's okay if banks vetted you, the exchange vetted you, you maintain that listing. Uh, so it gives us a leg up, but just the same, you know, uh, banks and, and vendors can be fickle and it's uh, subject to the whims or, or risk tolerances, you know, sometimes very small of, of some of these more conservative institutions. And it's just uh, a hurdle or a tax that, you know, you have to be willing to uh, deal with to capitalize on the growth of the industry. Okay, one last question for you. Um, yesterday, there was a stock deal announced for a, 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 a multi-state operator, um, uh, two large dispensary operations, if you will, combining. Does that give you any encouragement that financial restrictions are loosening or that investment appetite is increasing? Or since it was an all stock deal, is that just further proof that you really can't move too much cash around in business yet? Uh, so investor appetite is definitely increasing. I think the regulatory side of it is probably only a small piece of that to, to be realistic. I think as Andrew pointed out, it's, it's been slow going in terms of banking reform, uh, but, but people's risk tolerance, uh, you know, is, is inverse or is proportional to, to the opportunity. Uh, and so some people may be more willing to bear it uh, given the opportunity. I, I don't find that for the larger corporation, I mean, you can look back the last two years and see some massive deals in the space, some of which fell apart for, for non-regulatory reasons. Um, I, I don't take it uh, as any concern, the stock as any indication of uh, difficulty moving money around. There's a lot of appetite uh, amongst family offices, private investors, certainly not institutions much, 
to finance acquisitions. So Katrina I, nodding vigorously. I, I, I can tell you from personal experience, mm -hmm. people are looking to finance these deals. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good sign. We, we love to see it. I think the consolidation is going to continue, but I don't know how much I would tie it towards the, the regulatory developments. Okay. That's, that's a fair point. Um, you know, I always consider the regulatory first, given that I, my job is to defend people who <laughs> get in trouble, but um, I'm glad there are other business, uh, business priorities um, besides that. Um, okay. Let me, let me, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so let me um, uh, ask a few of those in, in our 10 minutes and please do send more audience. Uh, we're watching the, watching the chat box. Andrew, um, a helpful question. What help do you need from the um, financial industry community? What, what, what can they do for, for the NCIA? Who should they be talking to? What needs to be done? You know, I appreciate you asking that question, Jody. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing the financial industry can do is to help us make the economic case. Um, on January 20th, we're going to have a new president and we're likely going to be in a recession. Um, and the country is going to need tax revenue and the job creation that our industry uh, creates and has generated. Uh, we did, you know, 12 billion in, in business in 2019, um, and we're, we're poised to do 15 billion uh, in sales in 2020. Uh, but we really need to make that case to the federal government that we can create jobs, we can generate tax revenue. Uh, that would be the biggest help, I think. Okay. If I could just um, comment to you, yes, it, it would be great if any, short of legalization, if we have some, some sort of um, legislative framework that, sort, that provides cover for firms like mine, not just banks, wealth management firms too. <laughs> yep. Would you have been covered by the Safe Banking Act, Katrina? Would LPL don't, have, have fit in there? I don't think so. Maybe there were competing versions around, but it was mm -hmm. my understanding that it focused mainly on banks and perhaps credit unions too. Yep, I think I think that's right, um, and I think that you know that's that who it, that's who has the loudest voice and the biggest footprint. Right. So, if you think of it, it from it an AML totally perspective, sense. though, it's we're all subject to the same sort of pillars mm -hmm. of AML compliance, and in my mind, if there's going to be cover, it should be cover for banks, credit unions money transmitters, casinos, and firms like mine, because for a while now, um, the, the, Mar the cannabis direct businesses have been sort of trying to find any port in a storm, especially smaller businesses to inject their cash into the system. So they're going to casinos, they're going to mom and pop check cashers, and it just creates an awful lot of risk. So, mm -hmm. so Fox put away now. <laughs> I, I like the soapbox. Part. Yeah, and, and if I if I could agree with Katrina for a second, I think I think that's exactly right. And you know, the protection should be brought. Obviously, the easiest way to solve it is just to, to legalize marijuana. But even absent that, the protection needs to be broader because this money is everywhere in the system. You can't. It, it you know, you talked about the substantial revenue test before. I get that question all the time. What percentage of your money comes from cannabis businesses? And I find it to be somewhat of a. I mean, I understand the reason for it because you have to find a way to gauge the risk. But at the same time, it's what's okay. Ten percent, five percent, twenty percent. Is that question being asked of a plumber in California or an electrician in California? And so, if it's just targeted narrow protection, it doesn't really solve the issue. Couldn't agree more with Katrina. Thank you. Um, so uh, compliance, um, a, lot of, a lot of the questions either by regulators or by banks um, and, and the types of systems that um, the National Cannabis Industry Association, uh, the self-regulatory organization, Andrew and Tug, that you both work for, had to do with making sure that whatever federal business is done, whatever financial transactions are done is uh, with state compliant marijuana businesses. That's what gets the protection under the, uh, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of laws and public policy pronouncements. How do you, how do, you do that compliance? So let me start with, with Katrina. When you do have um, uh, some cannabis revenue, or you have 
um, some, some investor's wealth um, that you're managing that comes from cannabis, how do you make sure that the, the wealth, the revenue is coming from state compliant cannabis businesses? What do you do? Is it just a certification? Is it you hire a due diligence company? How does it work? Sure. I mean, and there's a, there's a cottage industry for this, right? Um, as I mentioned before, we're very, we're very conservative. And so we, to the, to that ring fencing issue I mentioned before, we're mostly focused on actually, unfortunately, keeping those proceeds out, even if it is legal at the state level. Hemp is an interesting situation and we could have a whole day long discussion on it. Um, but there, there's a stronger framework. And just as an aside, the hemp space is fascinating to me because for years and years and years, nobody looked at it. None of them had trouble getting services or you would have. And all of a sudden it's in the spotlight because of this broader po set of policy issues around, around cannabis. So I think for us, CBD, hemp, there's more flexibility there, but unfortunately we're pretty conservative. Okay, anybody else I'll, have, I'll, Doug, tell us about compliance on your side, please. Yeah, so you know, we we want to know that we're doing. We're obviously not a financial institution, not subject to to AML requirements other than you know Form eighty three hundred and and these sorts of things. Um, but we only want to do business with compliant businesses because it can give us comfort to our investors and to the outside world and banks and vendors. So you know, I think the first and foremost is verification of state licensure. Right, there's a state licensing system and a varying robustness in different states, but every every company we do business uh, in the cannabis industry is licensed. We have verification of their license on file. And if we don't, we can't do business with them. The sale just won't go through the system. Um, and, and so you can piggyback on the work state regulators do. And then the other thing we do, which is sort of chicken or the egg is we don't deal in hard currency. So our view is, okay, if someone's been accepted by a bank, there's another level of diligence for us, us to rely on. Um, which is why something like safe banking would be so huge for us because it would open up the pool of potential customers. Do we have trouble getting an account? No. Um, but man, I, there's thousands of customers out there that do. And, and I guess the last thing I'd say is, you know, the, there's a narrative out there that cannabis businesses are unbanked. I think probably the right word to use is underbanked. Um, the, they're out there and, and you see all these deals publicly announced. These companies have bank accounts. What they can't get is the full degree of, of financial services. And then where you really have the safety issues um, and the real cash flowing is generally with the smaller businesses like Katrina mentioned. Fair enough. Well, we have just one minute left. Um, I'll ask any of you pause for, for hope and encouragement. Um, that uh, financing cannabis ventures is uh, is possible, um, and uh, and then we'll sign off. Um, Andrew, any last word? You know, look, I think we're going to have a big champion in Kamala Harris um, in OVP. So I think that's a very good sign. And, and as I said earlier, I think uh, the uh, Pat Toomey chairmanship is a very good sign. Um, the other piece uh, is Barbara Lee, um, who has been a co-sponsor in the Moore Act and uh, could potentially take uh, Senator Harris's seat if Gavin Newsom appoints her. So some very positive signs happening. Okay, so politics is something to watch. Katrina, last, last word? I'm just worried that when it all gets resolved, I'm not going to have anything interesting to talk to my family about it. <laughs> the holidays and my board of directors <laughs> loves this stuff. Now, in all seriousness, I, I do think we'll get there eventually to, to the earlier point. The revenue stream is just going to bring about change. Okay. And Doug, in 30 seconds, you can have one last comment. Um, you know, I think Andrew said it all, or, or maybe what I want to use is my time to support Andrew and NCIA and, and all the organizations that are pushing for this change marijuana policy project uh, and others that are really making a difference. As, as Katrina said, and as we've talked here, there's the interest in this area is just growing and growing. Um, and while, you know, people may view it as inevitable that there's banking reform, tax reform, legalization, uh, it's not inevitable without support for those organizations. So please help if you can. All right. 
Well, well said, everybody. I want to thank um, the, the larger audience that we've had today. I hope it's been interesting. I'm sorry if there were any audio difficulties, um, but I have the finest panelists and uh, I know you heard them well, uh, and that was more important. So thank you all for joining and have a good day and keep a watch uh, to this space.